we live in an era where we feel that we are entitled to pursue our desires because this is the culture where I deserve to be happy. It seems like most people all want the same thing. We want to be loved, we want to be treated well, we want them to care as much for us as we do for them. Let me tell you something, God's way works. Monogamy used to be one person for life. Today, monogamy is one person at a time. Of all activities on the internet, porn has the most potential to become addictive. Relationships are the single most important thing to you in your life. It's the source of all of your best memories. It's the source of all of your worst memories. So we've been married for six and a half years, uh, since 2009. And uh, I think it's fair to say it's been a, an interesting ride. Um, we had probably a year of blissful start to marriage and then things started to get a bit more tested and uh, probably four years of it just being really tough. I definitely came into marriage thinking that um, you know that I was marrying the right person that it was going to be um, fun and an adventure I didn't think it was necessarily going to be easy um, I was expecting that there might be some tough times but um, it was harder uh, for the, that, that period of four years than, than I had anticipated. I think probably in the early parts of our marriage there was a bit of plate, plate throwing <laughs> and food on the floor and you know just stuff you would imagine from a 14 year old over the school <laughs> dinner table, that kind of level of behaviour and, and we were actually quite shocked I think weren't really we by, shocked, yeah. by our behaviour and um, just this deep rooted anger that just seemed to be in us both. There was a lot of just yeah struggling to exist in the same space and just misunderstanding the intentions of the other person I think um, a lot of just thinking the worst expecting the worst um, expecting that the other person wasn't on our side we finally made the decision to have a bit of a break from each other and I moved out um, for six months we didn't even see each other for the first three months and you know I felt incredibly lonely um, and incredibly confused. I guess after about four months of being apart um, we started talking again and we, we realised that we did want to give it another go and, and so we started dating again um, which was lovely actually and um, we, we moved back together a couple of months later. I, I really don't think that we would have made it through our marriage uh, difficulties without God's help. Um, both in terms of him helping us to understand our identity, in terms of helping us to understand how to love each other better, um, how when we feel criticised, actually it's not, God doesn't criticise us as, as people. God's love for us is unconditional, uh, which helps us to, you know, unconditionally love each other and see the best in each other. When I'm walking in step with God, basically my marriage is a lot easier. Um, he, God helps me to have the qualities that I need to do love um, and you know we're all naturally humanly impatient selfish looking for our own needs to be met and actually what's required in a marriage is something quite different it's a giving up of the self and actually that can only come from God Having got to the place where we've got to now, I know that we are going to be okay. I feel really confident that actually we're, we're going to be together. And, you know, I love Neil. Um, I feel loved by him. We both came into marriage having had some difficult circumstances, but actually that wasn't the, that wasn't the end for us. There is, you know, something about us being in marriage together, which is part of God's restoration story for us. Mm. And um, that gives us both a lot of hope and a lot of confidence. Um, as we go forward. Yeah. I moved to Bristol 30 years ago. I came here as a student. I was 10 years old. Um, no, that's not true. But it was 30 years ago. And uh, I've lived here ever since, and I've been in this church 
ever since. I've been part of Woodlands in all its different incarnations since it was just 50 people in a little hut in North Bristol on a housing estate. Um, seven years of my life, I lived away from Bristol. When I was 26 years old, I went to Cobham. It's where I met my wife. And there's two particular times that I remember walking down the Cobham High Street. Now, where I lived, in Cobham, in Surrey, it's a very, very well-to-do, well-off village. The Chelsea football team have a training ground there. It is Mercedes BMW City. But the high street is small. You can walk across it from one end to the other end in three minutes. Two minutes if you hustle. And two particular times in my life, I walked down Cobham High Street and I had such an incredible experience. It seared into my brain and I can remember it as if it was yesterday. The first occasion was when I'd been there just for a few uh, weeks, a couple months, and I was walking down the high street and I had the most bizarre, surreal experience I think I've ever had. Every single person that I met, every single person that came towards me, whether they were in ones or twos or little clumps, groups, families, every single person without fail looked at me and smiled. Huge, big smiles. Like it was some kind of conspiracy. Like it was some kind of thing where everyone had got together and said, today we're going to smile at this guy. His name's Philip Gennardo. Look at him. When you see him, smile. Everyone else was in on the joke. People were not only smiling, but people were actually openly laughing. People started chuckling as they walked up to me and as they looked at me. And I tell you what, I got so paranoid. I thought, what is going on with me that everybody is laughing or smiling or just beaming at me? What's going on? Do I have something about my person that makes me a figure of ridicule? And so I turned to look in uh, a shop window to catch my reflection and as soon as I saw my reflection, I got why people were laughing. I got why people was, were smiling. It wasn't that my flies were down, I had egg on my shirt. I had on my face, I laughed, the biggest, most enormous smile. I had the biggest, most enormous smile because the night before, she said yes. She said, yes, I will go out with you. One date, don't push it. <laughs> After months of pursuing her, and I knew that my dream woman was now my dream woman. And it was something that I was so happy, so joyful, so overcome with an inexpressible well of joy and happiness. I wasn't even aware of how incredible I looked. And every single person that saw me couldn't help but smile back, laugh, and just be part of my joy because I was in love. I had found this person and my heart was going Pitter, pitter, patter, and my whole future was bright. First walk down the high street. Second walk down the high street. Four years later, no one is smiling at me this time. No one is laughing at me this time. I don't need to look at my reflection in a shop window to recognize that I am haggard and I have had it and I am broken and I am burnt out and I am hacked off and I am cheesed off and I am at my wits end and I am despondent and I am despairing and I don't know what the heck is going on. All I know is we're married and it's not going so good. But I remember this walk because I remember looking and seeing. I can remember their faces as if it were yesterday. This family, four people, a mum and a dad, two teenage children. And I looked at the children and I, I must have looked weird. I must have looked like some kind of crazed stalker because I looked at these children and then I looked at their parents. Children, parents, definitely genetic resemblance. These are definitely, I can see it in both of them. These children are related to the man and to the woman and they are walking together as a family unit and they are okay and the husband and the wife are holding hands. And I wanted to go up to them and I wanted to say, how do you do this? How is this possible? Tell me, I need hope, I need to know how you have done this magic trick of staying together. Because all I had was a little tiny baby and the baby was absolutely driving me crazy. And my wife had turned into Swamp Thing. She had turned on me with extreme prejudice and our marriage and our relationship was just rock 
bottom. Why? Because loving is hard. Falling in love is easy. The first flush of new relationships and finding the one. Easy. All those hormones and the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the adrenaline coursing through the system, all that stuff on the wedding day and all that wonderful sense of romance and hope for the future. But loving is hard and you know this. And you know this, you've seen it in people. Maybe you're here today and you've got in your past relationship where you had the two walks. The one walk where you were happier than you ever thought you could possibly be and then the other walk where you thought, how did I get so low? How did I get into this situation? How did it get so wrong? How did it get so hard? And some of you, you've come and you've got broken marriages in your past or you've got broken relationships in your past. And some of you, you've got broken relationships in your family and your mum and your dad, they aren't together and they aren't able to walk down a street with two teenage uh, children because they weren't able to make it. And others of you, you know situations where it may be your folks, it may be your parents, it may be other people that you're just aware of. Maybe your friends, maybe people in work, maybe people that you're close to. And you look at their, their, their relationship and you remember when it was all great and all goo-goo eyes and all those kinds of wonderful Walt Disney feelings but now it's just, it's not bad, it's not awful, it's not horrendous, but you think, there's no spark, you know? There's no joy there. And all of us, we want relationships. If we're honest, we we want what's promised to us. We want what our heart wants. We want relationship that's loving, full of love, passionate love, fervent love, love that can't be quenched by many waters like in Song of Songs where we were reading a a couple of weeks ago. We want it to be joyful, not just dour, not just getting by, not just, yeah, we're doing the chores, we're holding the bills, we're getting through life, but joyful, exuberant. We want that kind of relationship where there's harmony, where there's peacefulness, where people are sticking with one another and they're being able to bear with one another through the thick and through the thin. We want there to be a kind of well, a kindness, a basic kindness and a lightness of touch, a, a, a kind of a joy between them that, that leads to you being just generous with one another and gentle with one another and, and to have a relationship that is profoundly a good thing, that it's, it's, it's characterized by goodness. People can look at this and say, this is something special. This is something good. A relationship where people don't fly off the handle but they're able to keep control of themselves. That's the kind of relationship that you want. And so few people get it. But tonight I'm going to tell you how you can get it. But I've got to tell you and I've got to be completely honest with you right from the word go. If you're not a church person here, and I know there are many of you, if you're not used to church, if you're finding your way back to church, you're not sure about the God thing, you're not sure that you necessarily call yourself a follower of Jesus, this is where this session gets a little bit dicey for you because everything that we've done up to this point has been applicable to anybody. Anybody can have good wisdom, good sort of help about how to do relationships. Anyone can get the stuff that we talked about, sliding and deciding how to make good committed relationships last for life. Anyone can get that stuff. Anyone can get the stuff that Paul actually says, this is obvious, it's out there, you just have to use your eyes. Have you not seen? But this stuff for tonight, Actually, I've got to be completely honest with you, and I want to be upfront. It only works with the God bit. It only works if you're following Jesus. So if you are not sure about where you stand with Jesus, then you've got two choices. One, it's quite good because you're off the hook. You don't have to worry about what I'm about to say. All you need to know is the person that you're sitting next to who is a Christian, you have now got my permission to judge them on what I'm about to tell you. All. Because this is how the Bible says those that follow Jesus should live. So you have my permission to look at them, fold your arms and say, how are you doing, kid? Let me see how well you're doing with this stuff that Philip said. And Philip has given me permission to judge you on this. The second thing, the second thing that you might want to do is you might want to think, actually, if this stuff is true, if this stuff is real, maybe this is the best thing ever. I mean, if this promise is true, maybe this would be something that I could get in on. Because I tell you the truth, when I look at this stuff, I just think, man, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd be becoming a Christian so fast, it would make your head spin. Because if this is true, it's the best thing ever. 
You see, essentially what we're talking about with loving and loving is hard is we're talking about the same things that make a marriage work or the same things that make a romance work are the same things that make any relationship work. And the Bible is all about making relationships work. And the letter that we're going to look at in just a moment, it's basically written by Paul, Paul again, who wrote most of the New Testament. And he wrote it, in fact, this is really exciting and, and really interesting because we are about to read the very, very first part of the New Testament. The book in the New Testament that was written before all of them. Literally, historians will tell you that this book was written around about 15 years after the cross. So 15 years after Jesus Christ was crucified, this letter was written by Paul, so around about AD 48, maybe AD 49. Paul himself had only been a Christian for about 15 years. He became a Christian about a year after Jesus had died and risen from the dead. And so he writes this letter to the Galatian church. And the thing with the Galatian church is that their big problem was relationships. He says, you've got relationship problems. It's going to affect you in every area of life. If you don't know how to do relationship, if you don't know how to get on with one another, to do community, to do sort of intimate, close walking together in life, it will affect your marriage and it will affect your community. It will affect your flatmate, your housemate. It will affect everything. And so he tells them how to do relationship. So just so that you know what we're talking about, if we put the map on, there's our world. And if we zoom into the Middle East... There he goes. Then basically Galatia is round about, it's modern, modern day Turkey. And you've got Jerusalem down there, which is interesting for me because on Tuesday, I'm gonna be 40 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, Kate and me, uh, we are still together. We're going to be in Jordan, just across the River Jordan, um, working with some refugee camps over there. But this is the Middle East, and basically Jerusalem is where Christianity started, and then it spread like an explosion all over the ancient world. And Paul took it to this group of um, cities in Galatia, this, this area. It wasn't just one city, it was a whole group of cities. And these cities and these early Christians, they were experiencing real difficulty in their relationship. And so he said this to them in chapter five. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Everyone say, the flesh. <laughs> Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. Do you ever seen that relationship? Do you ever see that marriage? Do you ever been in that family or been exposed to that household where people that should be loving to one another actually end up devouring and attacking and bringing down and criticizing and hurting one another? Do you ever see it when relationships go bad, when relationships go sour, and what used to be so beautiful and so wonderful now becomes just a nightmare? Well, this is what Paul is talking about in the church in Galatia, in that whole region, different pockets of Christians meeting in homes and, and small meeting places. And he was saying, look, you, uh, you're free. And that was the big thing with these kind of Christians who weren't from a Jewish background. He says, you're free, you're free, you can do what you like, it's permissive society, but don't use that freedom to indulge the flesh. I'm gonna say, the flesh. But instead, use your freedom, haha, to serve. You're free to serve the other person because this is what the command is, this is what the law is all about. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so essentially what you've got here is the dilemma that all the early Christians and Christians today and you and me today, we have to face. It's a difference between flesh and law. Now when the Bible talks about flesh, listen to me, this is important. It's not saying the body, your physical being is bad. You know, don't think for a moment that the church is anti-sex or that the Bible is anti-sex. We've already so I've talked about that. God is pro-sex, but even more than that, he's pro-you. And so when we look at the Song of Songs, you know, there's more coconuts in there than I care to mention. It's a celebration of sexuality and physicality. It is not, it is not, it is not saying your body, your drives, your sexuality is wrong, is evil. No, when it talks about the flesh, what it's saying is this. It's saying your broken self. 
your worst instincts, that kind of selfish, spiteful part of you, that thing that lashes out, that's what the Bible calls the flesh. It's the part of you that causes you to act in a way that is unbecoming, is not worthy of who you are. And we all know that within us, we have these kind of base instincts that will kick off And sometimes we can, well, that's what Paul says, you can indulge it, you can go with it. And when you feel that anger flaring up, you can just let it have full beam. Or when you feel a kind of lust for a person or for an object, you can just go for it. Forget the consequences, forget whatever it might do to everybody else. You just indulge. Do what you always do. Do what you always do, that's what the flesh is. It's that thing where, whoops, I did it again. You know, the things that I know that I shouldn't do, but somehow I can't help myself because I'm just human, I'm just weak. It's my flesh, it's my worst instincts, it's the base part of me, it's the stuff that I haven't really got under rain, and sometimes I just go with it. And sex out of context is part of that, but all the other things, the things I always do, but then, The law is about the things I ought to do. Do what you ought to do. And that is the kind of, that's the tension. Do I do what I always do or do I do what I ought to do? And actually, if you look at the map with Galatia and Jerusalem, what happened is there was a whole, well, Paul went to Galatia first and he told them about Jesus, the message that God loves the world. God has come down into broken humanity. He's become an individual, a person, Jesus Christ. And God shows us how to live the perfect life. And then he stretches his hands out and lives and dies for us, gives his life on the cross. And then three days later, he rises again and he breaks the power of death. And Paul gave that message. You can now live a new life. But after Paul had been there, Jerusalem Jews, a crew from Jerusalem, went up all the way to Galatia and they said, look, you guys, you're pagans. It wasn't an insult, they literally were pagans. They worshipped idols. He said, you're pagans, you've now become Christians, so you have to do what you ought to do. You have to do what the law commands you to do. You have to fulfill the commands and the command says, love one another. And when you give in to your base instincts, you do what you always do. But really, you should do what you ought to do. Because if you indulge your base instincts, it leads into bad directions. Paul says this, the acts of the flesh, they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Now, these... These made all the guys in Jerusalem, all those kind of religious types, all these people that were pushing the laws and the commands, super happy because these things, these five, they were known as the filthy five. Everyone say filthy five. New film by Quentin Tarantino. The filthy five, the the kind of the five deadly sins, sexual immorality, it's obvious. Impurity, it's obvious. All that kind of sex stuff. All the stuff you expect a preacher like me to stand up on a stage like this and tell you not to do debauchery, witchcraft, and actually the word for witchcraft in the Greek is, is pharmakia. It's, a, it's about you know, pharmaceuticals and, and trying to bend the world into um, something where you just take shortcuts, idolatry, debauchery, you know, just complete hedonistic lifestyle. And everyone goes, yeah, that's right, that's it, that's it. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on, he says it's not just that, but he says it's hatred, discord, Jealousy? Well, that's, that's an act. That's something that you do when you give in to your worst base desires. You start hating people. You fall out with people. You're jealous, jealous of people. We're not just talking about you know, witchcraft, idolatry. Yay. We're talking about jealousy. We're talking about fits of rage. You know, when you just lose your rag and you let rip. Selfish ambition. And some of you are thinking, wasn't well, that good? to have ambition, and who are you gonna have ambition for apart from yourself? You've gotta make your own way, you've gotta get ahead. But Paul says actually that that comes from a base instinct, that comes from a place of brokenness, that comes from something which is ultimately beneath you, not worthy of you. Dissensions, factions, you know, cliques, envy, envying another person. And then back to the good stuff, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And so that's what The flesh is all about. And so we've got this tension. We've got the flesh and we've got the law. We've got 
Do what you always do and do what you ought to do. But here's the problem. The thing that you ought to do is really, really, really difficult to do. And that's why I was walking down Cobham High Street in such a depression. Because I wanted to be good. I wanted to love my wife. I wanted to be that person that is patient and kind. I wanted to be that person that is giving and loving and forgiving and bearing with the, um, the other one. But what I found was, and this is, this is a, a sad and a horrible thing to say, and I'm sorry to be honest with you and, and to, to just expose you to this, but I discovered that when it comes to relationships, I was a complete, and still am, a complete and totally profound tool. Because I thought, going into marriage, that I was a nice person. I thought that I had it going on, that I was quite nice to be around. But I discovered that I am petty, vindictive, I am selfish, I am vain, I am self-seeking, I am self-serving, I've got a short line. I can lose my rag. I can be all kinds of things that I think, oh, that stuff, I know what I ought to do, but this stuff that I always do is coming out. And that's what marriage does. It strips you of your illusions. It makes you see yourself as you are. Because all of us can think that we're great until we get into close relationships, until you, you live with someone, or you have a flatmate, or you get into a romantic relationship, or you marry someone, and you have a kid. Oh, it's the worst. And you just think, is that the choice? Do what I ought to do or do what I always do because I'm going to be honest, I always do the wrong thing. And this is the genius. And this is where you won't be able to follow unless you're following Jesus. Paul says, put a line through that. Actually, let's scrub that because that's the kind of choice everyone knows we have. But I'm going to show you a third way. Be who you were born to be. It's not about doing. It's not about the acts of the flesh. It's about being the right person. Actually, you could be the person that you were meant to be, not always acting in the way that you really shouldn't, not always acting in the way that you know is, is, is not worthy of you, is shameful of you. Actually, wouldn't it be great if you could be the person that you were supposed to be? And so he talks about the spirit He says, this is an alternative. It's a third way. It's not the flesh and it's not the law. The flesh is always going to drag you down. We all know that. We know what kind of, you know, nasty people we can be. And I'm not trying to condemn anyone. I'm just telling you, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only nasty person in the room. But it's the law that says, you should do this. The relationship rule book says, you should be like that. But we find that we can't do it. We mess up. We fall. We fail. And Paul says, ah, I've got something new for you, something brand new, something that makes it all work. God's spirit inside of you. Not what you do, but who you are. And he says this, so I say, live by the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's an alternative. You live by God's spirit and suddenly that flesh thing, it doesn't have the same hold on you anymore. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, but the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. So I've got God's spirit in me and it wants different things to the worst part of me, the broken part of me. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. That's what the flesh does. It I don't do the things that I want to do and I do the things that I don't want to do and I fall into that same mistake and I make that same um, mess and I go down the same lines in relationship. But, But Paul says the spirit will want different things. The spirit will change the way that you react. And he says, but if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law either. So it's not about the struggle between doing what I always do, doing what I ought to do. Now suddenly I am being who I was born to be. And he says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we're back to the relationship that we wanted, a relationship that's fully loving, a relationship that is utterly joyful, a relationship that's peaceful and harmonious at its center, a relationship that is patient, where people are sticking with one another, bearing with one another and it goes on and it says this is not just about what you do this is about fruit fruit is something that grows in you fruit is something that actually is produced organically 
in you. And suddenly, if a fruit of love is produced in Philip Gennaro, then Philip Gennaro becomes a loving person and naturally does loving things because that's what loving people do without any big trials and traumas. In fact, the best way to write this is actually emphasizing the love because it says the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits, plural. The fruit, singular. So when we talk about love, that's the fruit of God's Spirit. That's what God produces because God is love. He's in the loving business. Love is his whole deal. Love is the beginning and love is the end. And he made you in love, created you in love, has been walking with you and watching your life, whether you know it or not, in love. And he has given himself to you in love. He's become a human being because of love. He's died on the cross because of love. He has risen from the dead because of love. He has brought you here and reaches out to you and sustains you because of love of love, 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 love. And that list that goes on, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all it is is the aspects of love. You know that famous passage, 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul defines love. He says love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And that sounds a lot like that list that we have over here. Paul is essentially saying the fruit of the Spirit is love, and it is manifest in all these ways. One day, 15 years into our marriage, in fact it was 14 years into our marriage, I decided that I wanted to do something special for Kate. I decided I was gonna have 15 years of loving Kate. And so what I did was, and I, I knew that it was uh, the anniversary of the, the day, well, it was the anniversary of that day that I walked along the Cobham High Street, it was 15 years later. And so I said, what I would do, I would have 15 days, and every, 50, every day I'd do something lovely for Kate, and I wrote it down in a book, a rule book, and I said, right, every day there's going to be a card, and I'd make the card using a picture of her. Every day there's going to be a little poem written in that card, and every day there's going to be a present, a gift. And so I made a little list. I've worked out what I was going to do. One day it's going to be chocolates, another day it's going to be a, a meal out, another day it was going to take you to the cinema, another day it was going to be a little token that says, yes, I will do the ironing, I promise. Don't keep nagging me every six months. Um, a whole bunch of different things. And it was going pretty well and she was really enjoying it or she was at least tolerating it. Until day 12. Day 12 was flowers. And I had um, got the card ready and then I'd gone about my day and I suddenly came back from work driving in towards my house knowing that I was going to be going out to another meeting in an hour's time and realizing I forgot. I forgot. I forgot the flowers. I forgot the flowers. And I had the card, but I forgot the flowers. And there I am again, I'm battling between doing what I ought to, the rule book. It says I even made a spreadsheet. Flowers, day 12. <laughs> doing what I ought to do. But I'm back with doing what I always do. Being unthoughtful being too busy, too wrapped up in myself, letting it go, being too self-absorbed, obviously not loving her enough. And actually, the rule book doesn't require much, just a bunch of spray carnations from the nearest petrol station. That's all, some ratty little flowers with polythene wrapping and the little label still on. That's all it required. That's what, do it, um, do what you ought to do, the rule book states. I hadn't even got that, I just did what I always, did. But I've been praying, I've been saying, God, please help me to be a better man. Please help your spirit to live in me. I want to collaborate with you, I want to walk with you. This is an absolute true story. This is what inspired us giving Hannah the bouquet of flowers, and it's a really nice bouquet of flowers. Because as I drove into my house, as I pulled my car into the drive, I couldn't believe what I saw. Propped up against my front door, a bouquet of flowers. Unbelievable. I got out of the car, I went up and I looked at, at this. It was, and I, I exaggerate not, the single nicest bouquet of flowers I have ever held in my hands. Not a ratty petrol station, not even Tesco's, not even Waitrose florist, but a proper flower shop. 
with a man that put, puts things together and it had all these different things in it and they were ornate and it was obviously incredibly opulent. And it was just propped up against my front door waiting for me. And I saw there was a card inside and I opened the card up and the card said this, Dear Philip, we, it was a Thursday, we are looking forward to having you come to speak to our church on Sunday. It's a church that I don't normally go to, my first time there. We thought we would send you this little gift of flowers as a thank you before you come. So I took that card and threw it away. <laughs> I took my card, put it in. Kate arrives two minutes later, I said, my love. She takes the flower, she says, you're an incredible man. I say, yes I am. That is living by the Spirit. <laughs> do what you ought to do, raticarnations, but let God do something. I did come clean and I said to her eventually, I said, God gave me the flowers. <laughs> God made me a better man. God made me a better lover. God gave me everything that I needed to do the thing that I didn't have the kindness or the strength to do myself. God inspired me, God showed me a better way. That is what living by the Spirit is all about and that is why being a follower of Jesus is the best thing going because we're talking about following the world's greatest lover who wants to pour into you his fruit. Grow it in you like a tree producing apples, something that naturally happens. There's a crop, there's a harvest, and it does not stop, and it grows within you. And now there's love, and it's coming out of you because you're walking in step with the Spirit. Just as Neil said on the video, when I walk in step with God, he makes me a better husband, a better man, a better lover. And now it's producing joy in me. Suddenly, there's a deep welling of joy in my personality that it's reflected in my relationship. There's peace, that's the Greek word, or the Hebrew word rather, shalom. It means harmony, wholeness. I've got it totally centered. It doesn't matter on my circumstances. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. It doesn't matter how stressful my job is. It doesn't matter if we're going through a difficult patch or the kids are keeping us awake at night. Joy and peace flood through. Patience, patience, patience. We watched a film the other day, Kate and I together, called Boyhood. It was filmed over 12 years, and you see this family grow apart over 12 years. And the, the father of the boy, he split up with the mother, and he says, after 12 years, he's joking. And uh, they get together over his graduation, and he says, do you know, I realize now I'm the man that, my mother, uh, that your mother always wanted me to be. If only she'd waited. I'm exactly what she wants right now. But we, we blew it. My wife was patient for me patient with me. She told me, she literally told me, she told me, I waited 10 years for you to approach something like the approximation of the man that I was looking for. But I stuck with you. Patience, it makes all the difference. And kindness, the little, little things that make a relationship sweet. Goodness, that there's an inherent value and dignity and, and worth in the way that you are together. Faithfulness is actually a fruit of that. If you love someone, you're going to be faithful to them. It's no big shakes. It doesn't take incredible willpower. It's a fruit that comes out of you. And gentleness, you know, show a little tenderness. That gentleness is in our relationship. We're kind with one another and we're gentle with one another and that we're self-controlled and even if I feel riled and rattled, even if I feel ragged and raw, I'm able to keep a lid. I'm self-controlled. Paul says against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions. So in other words, there's no law for this. There's no rule book for this. This is so much better than ratty carnations. And it crucifies that dead and broken and sad, vindictive part of you. And so he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So this is our big idea. Choosing to walk daily with God's Holy Spirit grows in us the qualities needed for loving, joyful relationship. You just every day say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Holy Spirit, would you walk with me? Holy Spirit, I want to welcome you in. Holy Spirit, I want to collaborate with you. We've actually produced a little card that we would like to give you, and it's got these fruits of the Spirit on. And it says this. 
Holy Spirit, help me to walk in step with you this day. You can pray this. You can take it. It's a business card. Put it in your wallet. Take it with you to uni. Take it with you to work. Take it with you. Put it by your bedside. Put it in your little card wallet. Let me not indulge my broken, selfish instincts, but rather let your selfless love develop in me. Let that love produce a bumper crop of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in my life. Amen. Take this and pray it every day. Take it and look at it in the stressful moments. Take it, forget about it, and then dig it out and realize, actually, if I walk with the Spirit, if I collaborate, if I invite God's Holy Spirit every day to come in me, fill me, suddenly I discover I am being who I was born to be. I don't have to dredge up some kind of huge self-will to do the right thing, to do what I ought to do, to be the proper person, but no, suddenly, becoming who I was meant to be, like Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to invite you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. I want to pray even as we worship, as we close things up, I want to pray that there be people here in this room tonight who experience you, who are touched by you. Help us draw close to us Fill us. Forgive us for trying to do things by the rule book or just trying to do what we ought to do in our own strength. Forgive us for indulging our worst instincts and giving in to our base nature. But allow us, Holy Spirit, to experience what it's like to walk our lives with you and to see the joy and the wonder of you growing within us, the qualities that we need for loving, joyful relationships. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.